I've been reporting on radical gender theory in American schools for the past six months, and we have another uh, hot story uh, right off the presses involving a very fancy private school in Chicago that was distributing sex toys to minors under the guise of LGBTQ health and diversity and inclusion. Uh, I've reported on different curricula, different policies, different programs in schools all over the country, and this is one of the most shocking. You have to see it to believe it, uh, so let's take a look. So I've been the dean for four years. During Pride, we do a Pride Week every year, and I had, um, I had like our LGBTQ plus health center come in. They were passing around butt plugs and dildos to my students, talking about queer sex, using blue versus using spit. Who is this? This is uh, an LGBTQ plus health center came in to talk to my high school students. And so uh, this is extreme. This is uh, probably surprising to a lot of parents that saw this video after it was released. But you really need to understand a few things to understand what's really going on here. The first of which, and I think the most important point, is that all of these programs that take radical gender theory or queer theory from university uh, ideologies and then bring them into primary schools, secondary schools, high school programs like this one, rely on a bait and switch. And you saw that in this clip. He says that we called in the LGBTQ plus health center. Um, and look, most people wouldn't oppose that. They'd see LGBTQ plus health week. They'd say, all right, that's fine. Uh, all kids should be healthy if they're talking about safe sex or something else. Uh, they, they go along with it. But it really is almost like a code word. Uh, it has nothing to do with maintaining your health to be uh, having adults uh, giving children uh, dildos and butt plugs, like he's saying in this clip. That's something that's altogether very different. It could be uh, driven by the ideology of queer theory, or it could be simply this kind of transgressive sex that he's stamped onto it under, again, this guise of diversity programming or inclusive programming. Um, this should be setting off red flags. And I think in any other context, if you had an adult giving sex toys to minors, uh, there would be a huge uproar. If this was done under any other rubric, any other language, especially language that more accurately described what was really happening, uh, it would have probably never happened or it would have been shut down immediately. The second thing that's important to know when you're looking at this clip is not to dismiss it as a one-off. Not to say, oh, well, there was this one incident in this one school with this one dean of students, with this one group of, of, of kids, uh, but we can say that that is safely uh, outside the mainstream. Uh, it's not true at all. Uh, I've reported on many stories uh, dating back to uh, earlier this year, over the course of a long period of time, documenting these kinds of programs, these kinds of ideas in many different school districts. I had another district in Chicago, public school district, that was promoting sex toys and artificial genitalia and what they were calling penis packers uh, so they could create uh, the illusion for female students to be perceived as male students. Again, that was happening right nearby in the city of Chicago. The second thing was the National uh, Education Association, the Teachers Union, this large group of teachers, more than three million members, promoting resources in middle schools and high schools, teaching kids about bondage, sadomasochism, and fisting. That's documented. That's absolutely happening. Uh, in fact, I actually went on Tucker Carlson tonight uh, to read from these documents. I held them up on camera and described these, uh, these sex acts in some uh, detail. I was surprised I was allowed to do it on television. Uh, but just to show exactly what they're doing. Uh, it's not about health. It's not about diversity. Um, in this case, it was about these uh, really crude and extreme uh, sexual activities. And I've also reported on school districts across the country adopting new policies, again, using these code words, saying that this is about gender identity. It's about affirming students uh, for their gender identity and how they believe that they are. But when you actually read the policies and you see the internal emails and you talk to parents who have been affected, all of these districts are very explicitly saying that school personnel, so everyone from the principal to the administration to counselors to teachers, should be affirming student identities, should be changing names, changing pronouns, uh, affirming new sexualities without notifying parents. The default is actually to keep these changes a secret from parents, 
even for kids as young as elementary school age. And so they're pushing these ideas, they're pushing these identities, and then they're ramping kids up, keeping it a secret from parents. And of course, this, this, this school in Chicago, this private school is no exception. Uh, as you'll hear, the dean of students who was uh, kind of gleefully talking about passing out sex toys to students uh, made sure to keep it a secret. Let's watch. And everybody's cool with that, like the butt plugs and the dildos. No big complaints. I mean, if the parents found out, would they? No, it's queer sex. You have so much freedom, so much wiggle room. So much freedom, so much money. I mean, nothing to do things. stuff. Trustees are okay with that too? Oh, yeah. They don't know. They would, it's like, we. I wouldn't even like run it by them. Like, why would I run it by them? They'd be like, oh my God, that's wonderful. And so you're really hearing two things. First off, again, secrecy is key, but he's doing something also very interesting. Uh, he's doing something that I think is important for parents to understand, is that he knows, you can tell, well, he knows, well, maybe parents would be uncomfortable, maybe the school board would be uncomfortable, but he's developed a way to create a, a sense of immunity for these programmings. He says, oh, it's about queer sex. And I think what happens in practice, very honestly, is that a lot of parents, a lot of school administrators would hear those words, diversity, uh, LGBTQ, uh, queer identity, and say, oof, I'm gonna take a step back. I'm not gonna criticize it. I'm not gonna really ask questions. I'm not gonna push back. I don't wanna be perceived uh, as an enemy of the movement. I don't wanna be perceived as someone who would oppose uh, these ideas or these identities. And so it gives people a little bit of latitude to operate independently uh, and operate uh, 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 in a way that under other contexts that they couldn't. So what happened after this video was released is also very interesting. Uh, this video, of course, caused some scandal. It caused an uproar with parents. It caused uh, some media attention onto this program, onto this specific school administrator. But the district did something that uh, on the surface appears surprising, uh, but actually is really standard operating procedure. The district doubled down. The district didn't fire the, te the, the administrator. The district didn't apologize. The district didn't promise to cancel these programming. They sent out a statement that did three things. That is really now the playbook when these districts get caught. I've seen this in my own reporting, the same kind of technique being rolled out. First, they ignore the specific allegations. So in the statement, the school actually uh, didn't say anything about specifically what was happening on campus. They kept very silent for obvious reasons. Second, they deflected blame to uh, supposed right-wing attacks, trying to delegitimize the people who discovered what was happening, who exposed what was happening. And once you divide this up into a kind of tribal or binary opposition, uh, it becomes uh, the LGBT community versus you know the kind of evil right-wing attack. That's the framing, that's the narrative that they try to go. And they try to deflect any real criticism by saying that all criticism is by definition bigotry. Look at the people who are actually exposing this video, in this case, Project Veritas. That's all you need to know. We're not gonna even tell you what's happening because who has seen it is really the, the only thing worth knowing. And then third, the most uh, uh, really bold, the most dishonest, the most uh, uh, kind of really bewildering claim, uh, if you think about it, uh, is that they said, well, this is just about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. That's all we were trying to do. Yeah, we were passing out dildos and butt plugs to 14-year-old girls, 14-year-old boys. We had adults coming from off campus that were talking about transgressive sex with other people's kids. Uh, or your kids, if you were a parent at that school. But that's just diversity, equity, inclusion, and for good effect, belonging. Uh, D-E-I-B, uh, a kind of ever-expanding acronym roller coaster. We're always adding new words as the old words get stale. So what's happening here? What's the technique? I think of it as the human shield maneuver. That's really what is happening. That's really what you need to understand. They take something that would be really roundly and widely condemned, like sex toys for kids uh, in school, and then they give it a label of a protected category. They say, well, this is LGBTQ health. This is a diversity programming. This is inclusion and belonging. And then by wrapping it uh, in a protective layer 
appealing to those protected identity categories, they can gain immunity from criticism, both because uh, these, worlds, these words are almost uh, 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 magical incantations. They summon up a new uh, feeling, a new connotation, but also because they create fear. They create this line that, that really says to a parent, uh, you don't want to oppose diversity, do you? It's a veiled threat that there will be retaliation using the technique of identity politics. And so you have this really strange transmutation of language that is deployed on the surface to obscure the reality of the ideas and the behavior that exist, uh, in this case on video, in reality. And so they suppress reality with this uh, uh, human shield technique that creates a cost for opposing it. It's a very sophisticated rhetorical strategy. And then they create a bureaucracy around it, the Dean of Students, the Dean of Diversity and Inclusion, the, uh, the Hall Monitor of Racial and Gender Microaggressions. What other, what, however big the bureaucracy is, however deep that it goes, uh, they know how to enforce it, they know how to protect the ideas by using vulnerable groups. Um, uh, it's dishonest, we should say. Uh, it's false, it's not correct. Um, and I think that eventually, this technique will stop working. Uh, because if you are, let's say, have a, a, a gay student, a gay child in this, in this school district, you could say, hey, wait a minute. Uh, I love my child. I support my child. I want my child to belong. I want my child to be accepted. Um, but I don't think that this person's identity automatically means that you should be uh, passing out dildos to all the students. Um, I think most parents have that kind of very practical attitude towards it. Transgressive sex should stay out of the classroom uh, with my 14-year-old. Thank you. That's really how we should do this. But what happens is that as people understand the lie, that this has nothing to do with LGBT identity, this has nothing to do with diversity and inclusion, it also starts to degrade that technique over time, and it starts to really do damage to that language. It starts to load those connotations uh, with these negative experiences in reality. You create a sense of baggage on the language and then by proxy baggage on the ideology. To the point where I think we're now seeing among parents, and I talk to a lot of parents, not just conservative ones, but centrist ones, left liberal ones in large American cities that say, hey, wait a minute. If teaching uh, my kid in kindergarten that he might be a, an asexual or a pansexual or a genderqueer uh, 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 identity, uh, if that's diversity and inclusion, I'm gonna get off the bus. I don't want that. You can call it whatever you want. I don't like that. I don't want that. Shut it down. And so in a sense, in the short term, this is a very effective rhetorical move for the left. You block, you stonewall, you deflect blame, uh, you deploy these human shield maneuvers to wrap the experience in a protective layer of language, but eventually it's going to stop working. Parents are going to stop caring. They're going to say, I don't care what you call it. I don't want you doing this to my kids. And this goes for parents of all backgrounds, all identities, at rich private schools like this one, and also at your run-of-the-mill public schools like others. That's what we're going to be happening, and the best thing for op opponents of radical gender theory to do is to lean into this, to dis deconstruct their own language, to actually play that left-wing deconstruction game and apply it in the other direction, and then to expose the reality and be really relentless be really courageous and fearless about it, to say, this is what's happening and we're gonna make it stop.